It's interesting to me um, in academia, how many times we hold students to account because we feel that they have plagiarized or we feel that they've presented information um, without any critical reflection on the possibility that there are other ways of critiquing the subject matter. Or we feel that they haven't invested enough time in really understanding the application of what they're studying to whatever area of practice they might go into. Um, they are like big stop signs for us as we review the work. And it strikes me um, of the paradox that often in academia, we hold students to a higher account than ourselves. Because of course, many of our knowledge systems include knowledges that are appropriated from elsewhere around the globe where they might be presented as knowledge systems that have emerged from the global north with scan or probably no reference to the origins of those knowledge systems or where we present ideas along linear paths as if that is the only way of understanding perhaps market systems or human relations without the possibility that there are legitimate ways from elsewhere around the world that the very practices that we use in punitive ways to dissuade our students um, we do ourselves. So when we think about our pedagogies, there is one word that I'm really hoping um, will stay with you is around the intentionality that we bring into what we do um, around decolonizing our pedagogies. There are so many different definitions of what we mean when we talk about our um, pedagogies, but of course we're talking about the underpinning philosophy, the content, the approach and the behaviors that we bring to that process of sharing and perhaps transferring knowledge. And when I talk about intentionality, I guess I'm aware that many of the people with whom I work either in the field of um, training provision, which is largely what I do or in lecturing, that there's very little reflection on specifically what philosophers they're bringing to the work, like what guides the content other than it kind of conforming to either their professional background or it's you know what's emerged in searches um, most easily, or the particular approaches that they use in a classroom space, and then what kind of behaviors they exhibit both individually as educators and collectively as organized organizations. When we think about coloniality, it then brings up the question as to who's on the other side of colonialists. And um, we speak about indigenous people and we might therefore speak about indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous ways of being. Um, and indigenous is a term that emerged in the 1970s of the struggle of American Indian movement and the Canadian Indian Brotherhood. Um, and it really relates to people with very diverse experiences of coloniality, but very clearly of colonialism and its different manifestations. Well, what does it mean to decolonize? Um, and I was looking at um, this theme in relation to social work. Um, and I guess the starting point is to recognize that we have knowledge systems that have been developed in what we might refer to as the global north or the west for some people. Um, and we passport those knowledge systems as though they exist in absolute terms, as if they are neutral and can be applied universally. And of course, what is well known um, from the works of Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, um, that new education is politically neutral. Adam Rutherford in his book, um, Control, um, published this year, makes the point that we inherit knowledge infected by the contingencies and political obsessions of our scientific forebearers. 
that in fact all of the knowledge systems that we draw upon with some belief in their neutrality are actually inherently biased. So, of course, if we wish to attend to decolonizing our pedagogies, we need to be focusing on the knowledge systems to understand where the biases are um, and how they are manifested in what we do. So, of course, to affect our pedagogies, we need to think about the research, what constitutes research, that hierarchy in terms of the um, validity of research um, might be open to question. I'm sure you've heard um, much of that already. How we understand knowledge and different ways of knowing and understanding historically how we saw that shift away from multiple ways of knowing to ways of knowing that rely on science. Um, and that battle between the science and the arts, the science and meaning is central to this. And in fact, in our everyday life, many ways, in many ways, we draw on other ways of knowing. The idea of feeling things in our gut, um, we use it and we might say, um, yeah, I know it's not reliable, but just one example of multiple ways of knowing. Um, the language we use. I was really struck um, when I was preparing this, how we can sometimes feel that when we seek to change language, um, particularly in terms of concept ideas and name places, that we often feel as though it's attended to something which is peripheral. Um, but again, in other walks of life, we see it as really central. Um, I remember uh, giving a lecture once and spoke of Andrew Windsor um, in passing. Um, and I saw a few participants in the group raise an eyebrow um, because I didn't use a title um, and I think they probably found it impertinent. I just kind of was struck by how on occasions. We think that language is really dear and really important when it matters to us, but when indigenous peoples seek to maintain language and knowledge systems that sometimes it feels as though it's um, peripheral. And what's the risk around ignoring the significance of language is that it centers whiteness and continues to maintain the oppression that occurred when indigenous languages were replaced by European languages and the, for example, names of places and ideas. Um, and then the what um, also includes thinking about how we organize um, our pedagogies cannot be individualized that if, for example, our approach is to be more inclusive in the classroom, is to you know kind of think about how we'll take the contributions of diverse people into account in ways that might not necessarily conform to what we've come to believe to be the rigors of modern academia. We can't do that on our own. Um, and the kind of last slide that makes that point um, from, from a book called Inflamed that decolonizing is not an endeavor um, that we can do on our own. And when we think about changing organizations, I think it's really important for us to tune into that. So in order for us to engage with um, decolonizing, we need to understand where the imprint of coloniality still exists in 2022. Um, and uh, on one of the slides, I've got a book um, which is about post-colonial um, social work, and I'm kind of really struck by my background is in social work, just in case uh, anyone was unaware of that. I'm really struck by the language of post-coloniality and Edward Said, amongst many others, um, as you probably know, would say, well, actually, it's a misnomer to refer to our current era as post-colonial um, for a couple of reasons. One, as um, Jessica Hernandez, in her book, um, Fresh Banana Leaves, um, published in January of this year. She kind of makes the point, of course, there are still societies, which I won't name, um, where there is still a physical presence and colonialism and empire in that traditional sense, um, which relates to uh, place. So that's one reason why talking of us being in a post-colonial era doesn't actually reflect reality. And secondly, 
of course, colonialism still exists in our knowledge systems um, and in our pedagogies um, for the reasons that I've kind of said before. So to summarize some of the key themes, um, it exists in the constant belief in science as being objective. It exists in the hierarchy of methodologies um, and in the marginalization of oral traditions. And the reason why that is problematic is because colonialism marginalized, ended many oral traditions and removed symbols and structures that may have maintained oral traditions, removed some of the written traditions and the written knowledge within communities. So that was stage one, to remove the possibility of people documenting and holding their knowledge systems in written forms. And then once we've done that in terms of a, a, an empire, we then marginalize what's left. What's left is just that ability for communities, for indigenous societies to pass on those knowledge systems through people. And even that last bit, our colonialized systems seek to suppress. Then where is colonialism in our knowledge systems? Well, um, one of my previous slides mentioned this. This idea of Western ideas being universal. It appears in psychiatry, a field that I'm well familiar with. Um, the globalization of societies uh, of psychiatry um, is well known. We've got agricultural systems that we passport. Um, we've got social work systems that we passport around the world as if because it's developed in the global north it will have universal application um, and beginning to identify that in the ways in which we present material is really um, important the appropriation this is the classic form of um colonization uh jessica hernandez in fresh banana leaves um i referred to her earlier on an indigenous scientist by her own self um, identification um, makes the point that um, you know permaculture for example a philosophy and approach developed in the amazon observed by paul molson then taken to the west um, and commoditized uh, sold as ideas in conferences and books um, without any real acknowledgement of the origins of those knowledge systems and Finding ways to backtrack through history, a friend and colleague of mine uh, is really keen on following the history, just working out where ideas and schools of thought emerge from. For us to really engage in that process of decolonizing, there'll be an importance in us backtracking through our knowledge systems to see whether or not we are using any knowledges as if they emerge from the global north when in fact their origins lie elsewhere. Um, and of course, just acknowledging that our searches for um, perhaps understandable reasons um, rely on us using English and European languages in our searches and how that creates a limited and partial view of what knowledge looks like. Um, even research into coloniality and indigenous ways of knowing are often undertaken by people who are using English language searches. Whilst we're on the topic of um, knowledge, it's really important for us to also be aware um, when we are exploring pedagogies, when we're exploring knowledge systems, that there is a risk around focusing purely on the intellectual endeavor of decolonizing, that our focus becomes how do we think differently? How do we create different knowledge systems? And that's why. I said there's something about the how the behaviors um, is kind of an important part of our pedagogies um, and our knowledge systems. Um, uh, I've kind of touched on that before. Our organizations, how are they structured? Um, and this kind of relates to the behaviors. Are we replicating masculinist norms that reflect ways um, that are linked very much to a kind of militaristic idea of a pyramid? with an individual who holds the knowledge and the power at the top of the pyramid and instructs, as opposed to embedding 
colonial and different ways um, which are of in, being inclusive, which might be uh, you know, consensual um, governance frameworks, um, some indigenous communities in their governance, you know, practice systems where there is not an individual expert or one person placed in a powerful position, but they seek to be more inclusive. Um, and organisations um, often centre whiteness and maintains that as the norm, even to the point where, where decolonising is spoken about, the focus then becomes on how will we make this tolerable for our white colleagues. And if we're thinking about our pedagogies, um, there is something around being confident and comfortable in centering indigenous perspectives without seeking to be apologetic um, to assuage or to appease um, those who um, might be unsettled by it. So here's a quote from um, that book Inflamed by um, Marianne Patel. Um, I, I like these um, two quotes. Um, yeah, in the colonial world, stories passed down by indigenous elders cannot be considered true until they are validated by the very empires that colonize them. Um, and this is about our knowledge systems um, that we can understand that colonialism has altered our relationship with knowing. So the how. Well, currently, so what we're going to look at is how we can kind of move from where we are now to something different. Um, we normalize inequity. Our data systems um, tend to just replicate the patterns that we've seen. Again, alluding to my area of um, mental health, uh, we've got data going back over 50 years where we talk about the inequities of people of colour or from indigenous um, backgrounds in psychiatry. And we just keep repeating that to the point where it has become normalised that there are these inequities. We will articulate at some level that there is something that needs to be done, but there is also an acquiescence because the degree of response is seldom proportionate to the degree of variation that we see in the data. The how. We move away from individual allyship um, moving alongside to understanding that we can build coalitions. And for us to do that, it means moving beyond the boundaries of our own institutions, our own teams, our own institutions, and even in terms of our own nations. So to what extent have we got relationships with indigenous communities who are thinking and doing and behaving differently and using their knowledge um, alongside ours to share and to build and to grow because often there are shared interests that have yet to be identified. Um, to move away from this belief that we as educators are experts because we have expertise in these hegemonic theories and frameworks, and to begin to routinely use indigenous knowledges in what we share in those educational settings, to be intentional about that. As I say, we run the risk of turning it into purely an academic endeavor, but it's start is the start um, of the process. Um, and what we can do is to also not just think about the interventions within the confines of our institutions. So if we're working with um, you know, students, um, pupils who are um, struggling in the context of social injustice, which might be material in their lives, there might actually be patterns that um, present themselves, that we no longer just treat each individual student as a case example but that we start to identify those patterns and to adopt a social justice approach. So a classic example of that is moving away from a conceptualization that thinks about um, the attainment gap by particular students, as if there is something internal to the individual and to think about the awarding gap and to try and understand what it is in terms of our systems of operation that might not just be within the institutions, 
but might be within a network of institutions in our society that creates the social injustices that mean there's an increased likelihood that people from particular backgrounds um, might not meet the conditions set by institutions that have that legacy of our forebearers, as we've already seen, these kind of colonial ways of understanding knowledge and the ways of being. Um, to move away from just national to global perspectives that Soph touched on. And to move away from an acquiescence in global power inequity and to move more towards activism as a norm within our pedagogies. There is a reality that government funded systems and systems allied to government funded systems will be constrained by what is possible within the everyday functions of our roles. Angela Davis makes that point that often people in our professions confuse their day jobs with activism, but there'll be limitations. And for us to really engage in the behaviours of decolonizing, it will require us to move outside of our roles. And that doesn't necessarily mean getting a spray can and spraying all over the doors of the university, but rather writing in ways that challenge hegemony. For example, um, that relationship between uh, racism, coloniality, and um, our economic systems that tend to run the world, which up until this point mysteriously has remained unnamed in what I've said to you today, those economic systems are closely interwoven with the racism and the coloniality. Um, but we also know that we're constrained in the ways in which we can critique those economic systems. That's just an example of when sometimes moving outside of our professional roles provides us with more opportunities to speak out in a more robust way um, about some of those systems. So here are just a couple of um, books that I think kind of begin to take us into this field. Um, you've got, you know, real great thinkers, Syed Hussain, Alatas and others who have been engaged in this work, Carla Ferreira, um, Franz Fan and Wretched of the Earth, um, the works of um, Bell Hooks, um, of course, um, really central to this. Um, but, you know, just thought I'd show you some of these um, specifically around coalition building, um, because when we think about our pedagogies, in some ways, it plays into that notion of individualized solutions to coloniality. And I think it's really important that each time we think about that exercise, that enterprise of decolonizing, that we immediately link it with collective action. And I guess that's where, where I really want to kind of get to, is just to underscore that. 